Hey there, Diocese of the Rio Grande. I know you will remember the Reverend Father Ryan Lee from St. Bede's Episcopal Church in Santa Fe. Ryan, tell us a little bit about your growing up and how the call of God came upon your life. Well, I grew up in Florida with my family there. Um, I grew up not Episcopalian. I was raised in the Baptist tradition. So I grew up in a, a small family church that my family was a far, part of founding many years ago. My grandfather was a deacon there. My father is a deacon there. And then, you know, many years ago, I found myself in, invited to, into the Episcopal Church. So I came in by accident 20 plus years ago and fell in love with this deep and beautiful tradition and found my way to a deeper spirituality and relationship with God that I had not had before. That's wonderful. I'm always curious about how people invite people to the Episcopal Church because we're sort of notoriously bad at evangelism, you know, that sort of thing. What was it that made the difference for you that invited you in? Well, in this case, a friend of mine that I had confidence in invited me to Holy Trinity Church in Gainesville, where I was living at the, at the time, and I sort of wandered in and felt at home. I felt welcomed. So That's wonderful. So two pieces, right, for our evangelism playbook. Invite a friend, hmm. right? right? And then let's make sure when the friend comes that the church is actually going to be welcome. Right. right? <laughs> because right. if you have those sometimes where, you know, you walk in and you sit in, that's my pew or whatever, that's not really helpful. Right. So, so that's great. So then had you thought about, I mean, with a with your father being a deacon in the Baptist church, your grandfather being a deacon mm -hmm. in the Baptist church, had you thought about being in the ministry from early on or did that come about later? I preached my first sermon when I was 14. Mm -hmm. I preached a revival when I was 16, and then I wandered away from the church for a little while. And like we often do in yeah. our late adolescence, early 20s, right. whatever, yeah. So, I mean, I felt the knock of God upon my heart at a young age, and then uh, felt it again later. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so for a long time, you had another career before now. That's right. So tell me about that and how that was part of your vocation as well. Well, there was a time when I was looking for something different. I had wandered away for various reasons from the church and was looking for a way to do a sort of ministry. Mm -hmm. So someone I knew well said, you know, the sheriff's office is hiring, and that's a unique way to do ministry in the community and to do something more for your community. So on sort of a whim, I said, okay, and I applied, <laughs> and they said yes. So wow. I worked for them for 17 years. Yeah. And in what capacity? Well, I, I worked mainly in the role of 911. So I dealt with emergencies from various angles, anywhere from answering your 911 call and dealing with whatever was on the other end of the line to being a supervisor and commander, as well as in charge of technical systems like the radio system, the 911 circuits, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Which was ministry. It was yeah, ministry. Yeah. And had you ever thought about law enforcement before? No, not at all. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. And you were there for, what, 17 years, That's right. You say? That's right. Yeah. Wow. And you must have encountered all kinds of humanity at, in vulnerable positions. Yes. I've, yeah. I've seen uh, the best and worst humanity has to offer, the the most loving and the most gruesome, and um, also how God works through that in despite of our own human failings. So. Wow. And so when, tell me the story of how the knock came back <laughs> when, because you were, you must have been in the sheriff's office. And, I was. And then how did the Holy Spirit come back around into your life? Well, I, I wandered in and out of the church, even the, including the Episcopal Church for a number of years, and then bought a house out in a small town east of Gainesville mm -hmm. in a place called Interlochen. And one Sunday, on a whim, I decided to visit the small Episcopal Church there called St. Andrews. And I was greeted by my, what, would, what would become my priest, Mother Diane, and greeted with open arms and taken into the church straight away 
without any question about anything. We, we were just accepted. Within just a few short weeks, I found myself doing music for the church. And then later, you know, I, I just kept feeling a call to do something more. So I got involved in the outreach ministries and in providing food and medical screenings for the community. And, and I, none of that seemed to satisfy this thirst that I had to do, to do ministry. And it became clear through discernment and other means the I was being called into ministry. And the only way to do that was to follow this call. So. What a blessing. And so then off to the Seminary of the Southwest. That's right. And, and how was that experience for you? Oh, it was blessed. You know, seminary was the most wonderful and hardest thing. <laughs> <laughs> Even harder than the law enforcement. It, it was way, Academy. It was way harder than law enforcement, I, which was no no cakewalk. But seminary was wonderful and hard at the same time. It, you know, you're dealing with the academics as well as the spiritual formation, along with you know all the things that go Living along in with community. Li- and everybody's kind of stressed and, yes. and working out all of those things. Together. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Well, we are so blessed to have you come to the Diocese of the Rio Grande and, and to St. Bede's, which is a wonderful place. Tell us about St. Bede's and what attracted you here to apply and how it's been these months that you've been here so far. Well, St. Bede's is a beautiful and wonderful parish. You know, it's very diverse. We have, a, it's a bilingual parish, which is certainly part of my call into ministry. I you know, did uh, the Latinx Studies program at Seminary of the Southwest. I have a heart for working in Latino context. So that was a big part of my discernment in coming here and being able to work in a, in a diverse community that is multilingual, multicultural, and very open to, to many expressions of faith. So it's been a great journey thus far. I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know the community and look forward to what we can continue to build together. So So there are people who may not know, they may have heard of St. Bede's and kind of that it's a multilingual, multicultural community, but like, how does that actually work? Walk us through a weekend or a week and how do you and Father Lucas and the lay leaders here embody that, you know, the the beautiful flower that is St. Bede's? Well, you're always sort of, you know, walking between context, right? Because in the mornings on Sunday, we have English Mass, and in the afternoon, we have Spanish Mass, and more Spanish Mass later in the week. So you're always learning, listening to whom you're walking with, right? And and figuring out where their context is. We have people that come to the primarily English-speaking services that also have a Latino background. We have uh, others whom have an Anglo background but like to support the Latino community and come to the Spanish speaking services. So there's this constant meld uh, and mixing of people that you always just have to listen and, and figure out uh, the context. Mm-hmm. So. And, and uh, the culture of Santa Fe is an interesting thing, yes. right? Um, a lot of people move here, particularly in their early retirement years, right. mm-hmm. um, from all over the place. Right. Uh, many Episcopalians just sort of show up because, hey, I just moved to Santa Fe. Right. And then there are people from all sorts of other countries as well. Right. So tell us about the flavor. Give us a sense of the flavor of the people here. Santa Fe is really a crossroads um, it, because we have a crossroads of uh, East meets West, uh, Anglo meets Latino, Indigenous meets traditions from the con- uh, Los Conquistadores. We have, it's a big mixture of many things. And there's, there's tensions that go along with that. There, there are certainly local tensions and local histories that run deep that we are constantly navigating. But it is truly a melting pot of the, those, those many cultures. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And I, and I understand one of your passions is ministry to those on the margin. That is right. That is a very large part of my call into ministry is working with those on the margins in whatever capacity that may be. I love working in with within migrant communities, within uh, the un, within unhoused communities, and any other group that you might consider marginalized. Looking to give voice to those who have been voiceless in in the structures that currently exist is 
100% a part of my passion and, and call into ministry. So. And then another thing that we have been talking about that's, that I think is related to this is this, the strong emphasis that you have had in your studies around liberation theology. That's right. And how that changes our engagement with mm -hmm. the gospel right? By, uh, by both making us aware of power structures that are working against the ministry of the gospel, mm -hmm. um, some of which have Christianity written all over them, right? That's right. So tell us a little bit about uh, liberation theology and what, when, how you found it and what it means to you now as a priest of the church. It is a way to give uh, voice to those have been, who have been silenced. It is a way to enter text from the margins to find those voices whom history have not recognized as part of the story and to raise them up to say they too are part of the story so you know to look at the gospel from this last week and to to talk about those who were not servants worthy of being in the kingdom what about those workers who are out in the fields gathering that what does that say to workers who have migrated here that are working to pick our fruits and vegetables that we go to the supermarket and buy. How do we give voice to them and consider the gospel from that perspective and what that might be saying to them? So we have to, to open that up to say, what is, how do we remain true to what the gospel is? How are we called to live into the promise Jesus gave us? How is God working to intervene even for those who may have been deemed unfaithful. How is God working through all of that, and how do we give voice to all of our neighbors? Because right, just taking up that text, there are ways that that text can often be preached, mm -hmm. which particularly if you're coming from a, a dominant place, mm -hmm. right? You look at that and you go, oh, well, I want to be on the side of the good laborers, right? right? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't worry about those other people. Right. right? But if we, the, the minute we don't worry about those other people, we've excluded Mm -hmm. people who are clearly part of the story right right and and so sometimes i think the way that text can be preached is is about kind of let's just focus on the winners mm -hmm. at the end of the day that's right? right and then we can convert all that through mm -hmm. to a place where maybe it's okay for me to exploit the labors of the people who aren't worthy right whatever i mean by it, not worthy right so right. all kinds of really insidious things start to creep in around church mm -hmm. if that's how I preach. That's right. right. All of a sudden, I am preaching that God likes to split people apart, mm -hmm. raise some up and crush some others, mm -hmm. and that it's maybe okay for those who are on the privileged side of things mm -hmm. to kind of dump on the other ones that are that's unworthy. Right. And then, and that's, that is kind of the story, if that is the story that I hear, mm -hmm. then it's kind of okay for me not to worry about people who are on the street because maybe they deserve it. Right. Whereas the whole message of Jesus in the, in the gospel is about how he reached out to those mm -hmm. who were Samaritan mm -hmm. or female or excluded. Mm -hmm. And the, the message of Jesus, which we hear over and over and over again in the gospels, is exactly opposite mm -hmm. to God wants to split you up, raise some up, and crush others. That's right. It is Jesus coming to talk about, if, if anything, Jesus is always taking the side of those who are right. not being privileged right. in, in the system. And yet, we pick that one text where Jesus is basically saying, if you're rich and you don't take care of people, that's when God's going to get upset to you. Mm. And we almost flip it completely around mm -hmm. to emphasize, it's kind of okay if you exclude other people and dump on them. Right. Right. So, so that's where I think uh, you've talked to me earlier today about interpreting Scripture by locating yourself in different parts of the story. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? As you study to prepare to preach or as you are engaging, mm -hmm. when you're reading a biblical text, mm -hmm. teach, me, teach us how you can move yourself around in that. Well, what if, in the case of the, this last Sunday's Gospel, what if you were a worker born into that system where 25% of the things that you produced were automatically taken? What if, you were, what if you had no choice in that system, you were powerless to break out of that system, and that's the system you live in? That is the reality of many people whom, we, whom are our neighbors, that we are trying to minister to and with. 
And we have to consider that sex from there. You know, people who are working for low wages who also are sending 25% of their income to their families in other places to help them live in the, in the conditions that they are living in. How do I locate myself in that text? How do I locate their story in that text? And, and that also, I think, leads to how do I locate myself mm -hmm. in other people's shoes? That's right. right? In, in the sense that the more we as a Christian practice can do, in a sense, what God did in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. which, which is to say, you know, here is God, creator of the universe, mm -hmm. access to all the cookies in the cookie jar. I mm -hmm. mean, God has everything, mm -hmm. does not need anything. Right. And yet God says, out of love, I'm going to literally put myself in your shoes. Right. I'm going to walk in your sandals. I'm going to experience what you, I'm going to hunger. I'm going to thirst. I'm right. going to feel anger and love and pain and, and anguish. Right. I'm going to weep at the death of a friend. Right. Um, this is God saying, I'm going to, part of my creative task mm -hmm. is going to be to creatively enter into mm -hmm. living with you. Right. Among you, Emmanuel, God with us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then if we are called to be, followers of Jesus, the body of Christ, mm -hmm. made in the image of God. Part of that creative energy is for us to creatively walk in each other's shoes, right? to look across the fence and say, what's it like to live over there? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, as Augustine said in a way that's often misquoted, there by the, there, but by the grace of God go I, right. Right? which isn't like, thank God I'm not like that one. Right. It is rather like that could have been me. Right. And therefore, I'm connected mm -hmm. to that other person. Right. right. You, you and I were talking about earlier the taking another scripture to, to walk around in and, and look at with more of a liberation theology mm -hmm. interpretation. And it was the Good Samaritan. That's right. Which often, you know, people preach, you know, this is a great story of helping somebody out. Right. right? But, mm -hmm. but walk us through the Good Samaritan and how locating ourselves in different places might open that story in a different way. Well, in, in the story of the Good Samaritan, we've all sort of heard like the classic examples of this is the, the person who did, did well and, and performed well according to the scriptures. This is the person who did not. But if we look at this from a different perspective, is the Good Samaritan didn't try to care for this injured man all by himself. Rather, he took him to the community to be cared for with the gifts and the gifts and contributions of the greater community. So when we look at it from that perspective of how do we bring others to the community to be cared for and be in relation with one another and accept the gifts of others, we create a more holistic story of creating a loving community. Just the way you talked about it with me earlier really got me thinking because I have often preached this story. Mm -hmm. Here comes this Samaritan down this dangerous road mm -hmm. and encounters someone other. Mm -hmm. And I've often thought about the othering going on here that, you know, the good guy, the mm -hmm. Samaritan, takes this person mm -hmm. in his arms, literally, right? And carries him bleeding, mm -hmm. pays for his mm -hmm. care. And, and that, that, that's, that can become a kind of hero story. Right. And it can become a kind of hero story where if I'm going to be the Good Samaritan, all I have to do is write a check mm -hmm. to look after somebody because right. the Good Samaritan didn't hang around, right? right? I mean, he just like dropped him off and then kept on the business trip saying, you know, I'll, I'll pay the credit card bill when I get back. Right. You could teach it in that sort of a way that from a dominant culture perspective, mm -hmm. it, it just encourages a kind of philanthropy that never engages really right. with the other, mm -hmm. which is not what the text says. No. Really. And what you've, just today, you're helping me to see that part of what the text says is he created a community in which everybody's gifts were, were provided for and cared for mm -hmm. by involving others right. in the care of one of their own. Mm -hmm and also creating accountability for himself, right. right? I will be accountable to you all mm -hmm. upon my return. So, so there are, are different ways for us to, to open up the scriptures by locating ourselves in a different kind of a way. Right. I have preached this text from the guy beaten up on the side of the road perspective. Right. I have preached this text from the Samaritan perspective. 
I've preached it from a kind of global perspective. But until you talk to me today, I never thought about it from the the one who was paid, the one whose house the guy was dropped off at. Right. And that opens it up in a whole different way. Yeah. So this is, it's not just kind of liberation theology stuff. It's also preaching class. Thank you for this yes, today. My <laughs> this, pleasure. This is really helpful. Well, Ryan, we are grateful to have you in the Diocese of the Rio Grande. I've greatly enjoyed getting to know you. And uh, God bless you in your ministry. Thank you so much. It is, I am thrilled to be here. And thank you for being here with me.